and thank you all for coming to what is clearly a star-studded panel tonight. Um, my name, today actually, sorry. My name is Gabrielle Steinhauser. I'm a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal in Brussels. And I'm very, very pleased to have this great panel today to discuss this very, very important question of future of the European Monetary Union. Um, as a journalist who covers this very, very closely, I will say that it has been rather frustrating in the last few months because nothing seems to be really moving. A few years ago, we were talking quite in detail about some very exciting concepts for the Eurozone, such as its own budget, its own finance minister. And all these ideas seem to have kind of stepped into the background. And I'm really hoping that today here with this panel, we can give a new impetus to the debate. And I've asked everybody to be as provocative as possible. So I'm really excited for some new ideas. And on the panel today, we have with us uh, the European Commission's Vice President for the Euro, Valdis Dombrovskis, and um, uh, the, Slovak, the, the Slovak Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, Peter Kazimir, who I, as a Brussels-based journalist, will say always makes the best comments on the doorstep. Lots of, <laughs> lots of loves, lo lots of great quotes. He has a high profile in Europe, I will, I will tell you that. Next to him, we have the Austrian Finance Minister, um, Hans-Jörg Schelling, who also makes us very happy on the doorstep very often, so thank you for that. <laughs> and then finally, uh, we have the Maltese finance minister, Skikluna, who I sometimes call Dr. Doom because <laughs> he has been known to make some rather gloomish statements, but hopefully we'll find some positive ideas from him today. And then finally, Guntram Wolf, who's the head of the Bruegel think tank in Brussels, which is turning 10 years this year. And um, we're very pleased to have him. He's always one of the great and thoughtful voices on this. Um, now I will ask the vice president to take the floor and deliver his keynote address, and then we will come back to the panel. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, uh, honorable deputy prime minister, honorable ministers, excellencies, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for this uh, invitation and for the possibility to uh, participate in a Tatra summit and uh, to address the uh, uh, issue of deepening economic and monetary uh, union. Uh, Europe has gone through serious financial and economic crisis uh, recently, but uh, it must be said that the euro area is emerging from this crisis more resilient. And there are a number of things we are having now, uh, which uh, we were not having just uh, five years ago, uh, in terms of uh, uh, euro area's ability to withstand uh, financial and economic uh, shocks. So we have strengthened EU economic and budgetary rules. We, have now, uh, uh, we now coordinate our policies throughout the year uh, within the framework of European uh, semester. And this was something which was largely absent before the crisis. There was stability and growth pact. Unfortunately, many countries were not following the rules of stability and growth pact, and not much uh, happened as a consequence. So now we really have much more uh, uh, robust fiscal and macroeconomic governance uh, framework. We also have an effective financial backstop, European stability mechanism, to help Euro area countries in financial difficulty. And we have a banking union to stabilize our banking sector and to ensure that taxpayers are not first in line to pay for the uh, mistakes in the banking uh, sector. And the European uh, uh, Central Bank is using its uh, monetary policy tools to the full uh, potential. Uh, just to give one example, uh, it was uh, famous uh, Mario Draghi's uh, whatever it takes, which helped to stop financial instability in the uh, uh, euro area. And whatever it takes was referring to the outright monetary transactions, so European Central Bank's commitment to 
purchase uh, member states' bonds in a secondary market in unlimited quantities if uh, necessary. And several months ago, European Court of Justice actually confirmed outright monetary transactions being uh, in line with the ECB uh, mandate. And actually, we saw a more resilient euro area during the recent uh, crisis in uh, Greece. Unlike the situation in 2010-2011, there was no domino effect, and despite the very turbulent and very difficult negotiations, there were very few spillover effects to other euro area countries, and the stability of the euro area was not in question. Then, uh, uh, to come back uh, to come uh, to the question of uh, economic developments, we are now seeing the Europe's economy growing. Uh, in fact, just uh, uh, some minutes ago, uh, European Co uh, Commission published its uh, autumn economic forecast, uh, uh, showing that uh, we continue to have modest economic recovery, but this recovery is uh, gradually. Uh, uh, strengthening in both Euro area and in uh, EU 28. But uh, this growth is uh, to the extent backed by temporary factors, such as low energy prices, low Euro exchange rate, which is helping EU's exporters, and ECB's accommodative monetary policy, including quantitative uh, easing. And the recovery is still vulnerable to external uh, shocks. So we now must use the time which uh, uh, we have due to those temporary positive factors. We must use this time wisely to reform the structure of our economies. As uh, also Maria Draghi has uh, outlined, that you cannot solve structural problems in the economy only with monetary policy uh, uh, tools. And we need to go further and to make the final steps to make economic and monetary uh, union more uh, uh, durable, more stable, and to ensure that it lives up to its uh, uh, potential. So the report of the five presidents, presidents of the five uh, EU institutions uh, on the completing the EMU shows the way. It presents a vision and a roadmap for completing the economic and monetary union by 2025. And it underlines the need for economic and social convergence. This means bringing an economic and social levels across Europe closer together and closer to the best performers. So to have a convergence towards the top, not race to the bottom. And with convergence, we mean convergence both within and between or among member states. So progress needs to be done uh, in uh, parallel on four fronts. First, towards a genuine <coughs> economic union that ensures uh, that each economy has a structural features to prosper within the EMU. Second, towards financial union to increase the risk sharing with the private sector, complete banking union and accelerate capital markets union. Third, towards fiscal union to deliver both fiscal sustainability and uh, fiscal stabilization. And first, towards stronger political union, including stronger democratic accountability, legitimacy, and institutional strengthening. It's an ambitious project. It will not happen overnight. But we can make progress already now. Two weeks ago, the European Commission put forward a package of initiatives that can be taken within the existing treaty and uh, within existing uh, legal basis, something what we call deepening by doing. And we see these initiatives as a stepping stones towards a second stage for a more far-reaching measures to complete the uh, EMU. So now let me mention the most important uh, initiatives on economic governance. We propose to improve the rules and mechanisms we have put together in recent years to look at economic policy as a matter of common European concern, and in particular, the European semester. So we aim to better integrate the euro area and the national dimension in the European semester, and to do so with more transparency and less complexity. We will put more emphasis on social and employment developments, including by involving EU and national social partners even more in decision-making. 
and we will promote convergence by benchmarking and pursuing best practices. The Fire President report recognizes the increasingly important role of competitiveness in our economies. The crisis revealed underlying problems of competitiveness and deep economic, uh, macroeconomic imbalances in Euro area countries. Without the possibility to adjust the currency exchange rates in individual Euro area countries, proper adjustment mechanisms are needed to identify and address compet competitiveness challenges early on. We are therefore proposing the national competitiveness boards to be set up in Euro area member states. They would be independent bodies which would track, for example, how uh, wages, cost and other competitiveness factors develop within uh, member states. On the fiscal side, we will continue applying the existing rules created by the six-pack and two-pack, but we need to do more to ensure full transparency. We are therefore setting a new European fiscal board Five high-level experts will work in full independence to provide advice on the implementation of fiscal rules and contribute to greater transparency. Uh, at the same time, we need to increase democratic legitimacy and accountability. We will work more closely with national parliaments, social partners and others, and we will engage with the European Parliament in democratic debates on shared priorities. It is equally important uh, to ensure that our voice is strong on the global stage. It would make sense to consolidate our position and to have unified stance internationally. So we propose to gradually develop a unified representation of the Euro area in the International Monetary Fund. We propose that the President of the Eurogroup should ultimately represent the Euro area internationally. Finally, in a short time, we have created a banking union that underpins confidence in our banks and safeguards financial stability. But we need to finish what we have started. In particular, we have to implement what has been agreed so far, the Bank Resolution and Recovery Directive and the Deposit Guarantee Scheme Directive. We need to reach an agreement on the bridge financing on the Single Resolution Fund, which comes into force at the beginning of the next year. And we pl plan to move towards European Deposit Insurance Scheme, building on a mechanism of reinsurance. And we want to continue to reduce risks in European banking system. The Commission will present legislative proposals on deposit insurance before the end of the year. And uh, at the end of the day, people have to be confident uh, that their savings are safe, regardless in where, where in Europe their bank is located. All the measures uh, I have set out can be uh, worked on right now. But at some point, we will need a more far-reaching measures to complete the EMU, some requiring treaty change. In spring 2017, the Commission will set out concrete ideas to fully complete EMU, but reflections on the second stage of completing EMU must start now, and we want to consult broadly, gathering ideas from across Europe. Because our main challenge is to shape consensus for these more fundamental steps, not only uh, among governments, but also uh, among Europe's citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, a successful economic and monetary union is in the interest of all EU member states. And it is in the interest of all member states that we can deepen EMU, so we do not create new barriers towards member states that have not, yet, uh, that have not yet joined the Euro. The European Commission is committed to keeping the process of deepening EMU transparent and respecting the integrity of the EU internal market. And I personally want, to, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, want that completing EMU will make the Euro an even more attractive currency, also for those member states that so far have not uh, joined in. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you.